Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and welcome to the Inner Voice Show, part of the Evolving Mind series in the Togetherness Media. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Today, I'll bring you the latest research from Yale University about um, how our frontal cortex, our brain, actually has a way of dealing differently with people who um, are not in the same social standing than we are, or just diversity that are different than us. So there's good news. Our brain can do that. We can actually socialize with people who are different than us. And then I'll end the show. I'll bring you Dr. Jeffrey Zeit, who's a founder and a director of the Milton H. Erickson Foundation and the architect of the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conferences and the author of more than 20 books. We will talk about ways to handle your anxiety in the midst of all the uncertainty that is there now. And then I will speak to Maggie Craddock, an executive coach known for her work with Fortune 500 CEOs and senior management and the author of Lifeboat, Navigating Unexpected Career Change and Disruption. We talk about how to become proactive in your career in the midst of chaos. I love to hear from you. So connect with me through my website, fujan.com, and follow my social media and message me with your comments and topics of interest. Love to hear from you and know what are your interests so I can talk about them or bring a guest who can actually address those. But before that, let me tell you about the tip of the week. There's a certain experience of shock when the feeling of disappointment arises, when, a, when I see a child observe one or two of their parents act out immaturely, uh, violently, viciously. And I've spoken with kids who cry themselves to sleep when their parents behave in a way that they have told the kid not to. I recall talking to a little boy whom his father told him never to lie and watched his father get drunk and lie to his mom about it. He said, I'm confused. My dad is supposed to take care of me and teach me how to act, but he tells me one thing and then he does the same thing he told me not to do. I feel I can't trust him or listen to him anymore. That means I'm alone and have to figure out life on my own. That's pretty scary. I've spoken with young adults who have trusted a mentor, a teacher, or a religious figure to guide them toward adulthood and all the right skills to learn so that they can have a good life ahead. Then one day, they witness their mentor act out out of get integrity or even be unethical. Feelings of disappointment, disgust, confusion, and shame for believing someone who did not deserve their respect surfaces. This past week, I've been hearing many people having similar feelings about watching people who they have put their trust into making major decisions for their life, life of their families, children, and businesses act very immaturely and out of integrity with a sense of righteousness and remorse and with cert certain lack of responsibility to and accountability to people around them. I hear and sense feelings of disgust, powerlessness, hopelessness, and contempt creeping in. It's important to uphold the values that you have intended to live by and hold others accountable to the values that either they claim or that their positions require anyone in that position to have. Observe your thoughts, dualities, needs, feelings, actions, behaviors, the way that you deal with the world and yourself. What values are you upholding? Are you upholding your values and are on integrity in different areas of your life? Or are you kind of like, you know, at times do whatever and don't even take it in that you've done that? What type of feedback structures have you created so that you can notice when you go off integrity? Do you come back to what you said it was important and the values you said it was important? Or do you just justify your behavior when it's not appropriate? So I suggest take the awareness integration path through my Life Reset book to become more aware of yourself and how you impact your own life and the life of others around you. Let me know how I can be a support to you. Remember, every word and every action has an impact. So act in a way that you and others can be proud of you. We'll be right back after these messages with the latest research.
welcome back. Here is the latest research. Our brain responds differently if we talk to a person of a different socioeconomic background from our own compared to when we speak to someone whose background is similar, according to a new imaging study by University College London and Yale researchers. In this study, which was published in the Journal of Social, Cognitive, and Affective Neuroscience, 39 peers of participants had a conversation with each other while wearing headsets that track brain activity. Researchers found that among pairs of people who had very different socioeconomic backgrounds calculated according to education level and family income, there was a higher level of activity in an area of the frontal lobe called the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The area is associated with speech production and rule-based language, as well as cognitive and attentional control. The findings support previous research suggesting that frontal lobe systems play a role in detecting bias and helping us to regulate our behavior to avoid bias expression. Now, the increased activity in the left frontal lobe was observed in both participants and was more alike than the brain responses of participants talking to someone of a similar background. In a questionnaire, following their task, participants paired with people of different backgrounds reported a slightly higher level of anxiety and effort during their conversation than those in similar background uh, pairs. Researchers stated for the first time, we have identified the neural mechanism involved in social interactions between people of different backgrounds. And they said that they believe our findings offer a hopeful message. We know that human, humans can have positive social encounters with others who are different. Doesn't seem like it at this point, but good news, science says we can. Now we have the neurobiological basis that our brains have apparently developed a frontal lobe system that helps us deal with diversity. Thank God. Researchers wanted to know if the brain responded differently when we talked to others of a different socioeconomic background. Now we know. It does. It does. And that, that humans have a neurobiological, uh, a neurobiology that helps us navigate um, social differences. And we really need it at this time. We really need to be able to navigate all of that um, with all that's going on. So uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Dr. Jeffrey Zeich. Welcome back everyone, I'm Dr. Pujan Zane. I am so excited to have Dr. Jeffrey Zeig with me. He is the founder and the director of Milton Erickson Foundation. He has edited, co-edited, authored, and co-authored more than 20 books on psychotherapy that appear in 12 foreign languages. Dr. Zeig is the architect of the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conferences, the Brief Therapy, and the Couples Conferences. He's a psychologist and a marriage and family therapist in private practice in Phoenix, Arizona. And he conducts workshops internationally in more than 40 countries. And he's the president of Zeig, Tucker, and Tyson, publisher in behavioral science. And more than any, he is the main inspirer for me, and I love him, and I'm so excited to have him on my show. Thank you for being here. Super. It's a pleasure. Always a pleasure. You're doing great things, and I'm glad to contribute. Thank you. Dr. Zeig, um, there's a lot, a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of um, uh, depression. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of... Um, not knowing what's going to happen. And somehow every day there's more confusion. It seems like it gets added in to people in the world because of the pandemic, because of, you know, we're thinking, okay, it'll be done. And now it's the, the second wave. And then we'll think it'll be done again. And then it's the third wave. The life has really changed. And then yet it appears to be still temporary. Like it hasn't changed in a way that we say, that's it. This is the way from here on we're going to be. It's more like until, until further notice, until further notice. And this has created a lot of, um, of the frustration, um, uh, anxiety, panic, 
um, OCD, um, not knowing what to do with socialization, who am I, all of the above. So share with us your wisdom and what to do. Sure. Um, well, don't look for certainty because you won't find it. So anxiety is a disorder of being hyper-realistic. If, if I saw all of the problems that exist in this seemingly relatively secure room that I'm sitting in right now, I could get nervous. So if you're hyper-realistic and you see all of the problems, all of the threats, all of the complications, then you can make yourself anxious. Being able to function in the world entails having some sense of adaptive denial that you're able to overlook or at least shall put aside some of the immensity of the problems and complications that face us. Now, um, this is nothing new. Uh, I had just finished rereading a book that I read in college by Albert Camus, the French existential author, called The Plague. And it was written uh, uh, 72 years ago. It was written in 1947. And it describes a, um, I think, Algerian community in which plague cripples uh, and exiles everyone within that community. And the psychosocial description of what Camus writes 72 years ago fits to a T what's happening with us today with the coronavirus. And that we need to bring our resilience into play because there are too many uncertainties and we could all, we're all one virus or one accident, one life-changing event uh, away from something that will turn our life upside down. So um, we need to do the best that we can in adapting to these circumstances. And how do we tap into our resilience? One of the uh, concepts that I've really seen is everybody uh, watching outside and waiting for the outside world to um, somehow shift for them to shift. But if we also come back in and see what is it that I, I can do, even though the world will change regardless of whether I want it or not, but I can't predict how it will change. How can I come back and build uh, from my own strength and find my own footing in, in the midst of all of these changes? When I had to graduate from high school, I had to write an essay. And I'm not even sure that the time that I knew the exact meaning, but I, I was able to discern enough to get through. It was that adversity is the test of a strong person. That was the theme. Adversity is the test of a strong person. Are you there? Build a library of how we have adequately dealt with adversity in the past, how we have been challenged and how we have risen to the occasion or coped adequately or healed effectively. And we start reviewing all of the examples of resilience that we have. It helps us to build a resilience for dealing with the current circumstances. We lost your voice for a bit in the middle when you were talking about the uh, resiliency. So um, can you just share a little bit more about that? Yes, we all have a history. We have a history of being able to deal adequately with difficult circumstances. We have a history of being able to heal when we have been hurt. So one of the things that we can do is to journal, to review, how have we dealt adequately with difficult circumstances before? And as we do that, we build our realization of our own resilience and we stop frightening ourselves about the possibilities of what could or may or might happen in the future. Now, just like some other um, area that I've really been witnessing also is, um, people wearing masks or not, and then how to be with each other. I think that, um, you know, when you, when you look at something temporary, you're constantly um, shifting your life based on the temporary. I've noticed that people have, although the, the uh, pandemic is rising, but the way that we have been with it is almost like, okay, I'm tired of this. So they've really loosened up 
with friends and family and people are they're going together and you know having to be in the party so um what do we do with this concept of our responsibility to ourselves and the rest of our community in a sense um when the temporariness of something is is there where it's an uncomfortable concept and yet um we want it over so we pretend it's over and then we are still responsible for how we are with ourselves and everyone else and i've seen this a lot where people come to my office and also although the protocol is to wear the mask they're tired of it i get it and then you know i request for them to put that on because obviously i'm responsible for everybody else who comes there and then we go into you know gatherings and you see like somebody comes in with one and then in the middle of it they took it off it's like okay you know i'm i'm i have no symptoms i don't have an issue and i sense this struggle with people that about this concept what are your thoughts about it? well as i was saying i was reading the plague by camus and he points out that apathy can be one of those stages where people become so calloused about the situation that they ignore their responsibilities. What you're doing right now is very good. You're reminding people, this is a responsibility that you have to your body. This is a responsibility that you have to other people. And it's easy to, to be lax, but when you think about the consequences, the consequences for the president right now, and of course we all hope that he recovers adequately, uh, but the consequences are enormous. So then sometimes we have to be reminded about our responsibilities, but it's not that information is the royal road to helping people realize a concept such as I'm a responsible person. If you wake up in the morning and before you put your bedroom slippers on, you remind yourself, I'm a responsible person, you start the day very well. And there, uh, Viktor Frankl, a great uh, Austrian psychiatrist, uh, said that if there's a statue of liberty on the east coast of the United States, there should be a statue of responsibility on the west coast. We should live somewhere between liberty and responsibility and balance those two equations. Well, the responsibilities that we have to others are enormous. There was a, a quote by Will Rogers, it's a little graphic, but Will Rogers said that some people learn by reading, that's a good thing. Some people learn by observation, that's a good thing. Some people only learn by peeing on the electric fence. And so if, if you're going to go out and you're going to take a chance of contaminating yourself and your family, loved ones with a virus, you, you're, you're, you're learning in a very painful way about the difficulties that you could have avoided. It's a, it's a matter of acting as if you were doing something for the second time and avoiding the mistake that you made the first time. Definitely. Um, I know that life has changed, and so all of the co beautiful conferences that you had founded and conducted and put out, and it was a joy to uh, to be with you and all of the experts in the world of psychotherapy, uh, that has to have gone into a virtual mode. Uh, the evolution of psychotherapy now is, uh, is on a virtual mode. Can you share a bit about uh, this amazing conference that comes in almost every three years now with everyone? that is a master in, um, in this field. Yes, it is a, a gathering of the titular leaders of different schools of psychotherapy. So it would be tantamount to having a conference on cars where the president of Mitsubishi, the president of Ford, the president of Honda get together and they talk about the commonalities they're involved with making cars rather than making this into a competitive enterprise. It's a cooperative enterprise. What are commonalities across different schools of psychotherapy? And this is the 35th anniversary of the initial conference, 1985, which celebrated the 100th birthday of psychotherapy. So, okay, well, here's a difficult situation. We're not going to meet in public. Let's do it virtual. Let's figure out a platform that will work where people can get a, a virtual education. And not only that, let's have some value added additions to it. Because if you went to the Evolution Conference and you had eight simultaneous sessions, you couldn't go to the other seven. You were stuck in one of them. Well, now with the idea of making it virtual, the entire conference is available to registrants for a year. 
and they can go over all of the different presentations that have been recorded. So now it's not that you lose something, it's that you gain something. And uh, some of the uh, benefits of being able to do this more economically, you can stay in your home, in your office, and you can attend the conference, get the education that you want, and also be able to we get continuing education credits, which is very important to people from the United States. But at the current moment, I, I think we have, uh, we're, we're, we're getting somewhere between 4,000 and 4,500 people who are registered for the virtual conference. So it's, it's doing very well and uh, will be a grand event. And that's uh, for a week. It's uh, De uh, December uh, 13th is the, the opening of the conference, but there's a pre-conference day and a post-conference day. So the entire conference is uh, seven days. It's an opportunity for people who are in the field of psychotherapy to get a remarkable education from some of the people whose work defines current practice. Yes, it always has inspired me um, to be a therapist and inspired me to grow as a therapist. Um, and that's amazing because I always used to come to the conference and then purchase all the audio and video because I wanted to hear everything. And this really gives us the opportunity to be able to hear from everyone. Um, so they can find it in um, evolutionofpsychotherapy.com? Exactly, evolutionofpsychotherapy.com. Something you just said, I think it's beautiful, which we can also look at it from um, the bigger picture of life, which is, although some things are taken away from us, but as we shift and transition to a new ways of being, there's also these added elements. And if we could take that also into our own life with all the changes that are there to also look at what are some of the benefits that these changes have created for us. Now, this is what we call a defining characteristic of an Ericksonian approach, which is called utilization. So the, the anxiety, if you define it as anxiety, it's a medical problem and you need to be medicated to deal with problems that you have in your neurotransmitters or muscular structure. If we think about anxiety in social terms, anxiety is excess energy. Anxiety is a process of beaming into an unpredictable future, scaring yourself with the unpredictable future and bringing that into the present, but it's an energy. And if we think about how can we harness that energy, what can we do constructively with the energy? And we stop thinking about it as a medical condition, not that there's anything wrong with that. If that's your choice, then treat it as a medical condition. But there's a virtue in, in every fault, in every context, like anxiety, if you're in the Olympics and you're going to be a pole vaulter and you have a billion sentient beings watching you, high anxiety is the ideal performing state because that's when you break a record, you don't break a record in practice. So there's a utility to excess energy and in some circumstances it works very well for us. What is the virtue of the fault? What is a context in which this can work for me? What is a way of dealing adequately with the circumstances that I'm facing? How can I make this into something? Uh, how can I take a bit of straw and fashion it into gold? And in one minute, if we haven't said something that you really wanted everybody to know, what would that be? Well, um, you know, you have a few choices in life and one of them is to be happy. And that's an easy choice because it's free, it doesn't cost anything to be happy. So look, try, so uh, uh, being able to look at the benefits in any situation, the virtue in any situation, what is the good thing that I can do? How can I be meaningful? How can I help other people to struggle with their problems? How can I do things that are productive? How can I exercise love and make love a central facet of, the process of being alive. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeffrey Zeig. If you, uh, if everyone would like to find Dr. Zeig, you go to jeffzeig.com and then evolutionofpsychotherapy.com. I'm so excited about this year's conference and always excited to have you on my show. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And for everyone, uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian Zain, and I'm a psychotherapist and a life coach. If you are experiencing anxiety, depression, 
loneliness, isolation, fear, fear of what's going on with all that's going on in the globe with the coronavirus. What's going to happen to you if you've lost your job and you have a lot of anxiety and you don't know what's going to happen to you and your family. If your kids are at home and you're not used to it and you have no idea how to handle them. If you're working from home and all the structures have changed and you don't really know how to concentrate and restructure and motivate yourself, I'm here for you. Call me and let's have online therapy for anyone who's in California and online coaching for anyone who's in the world. Go to my website, fujan.com, F-O-O-J-A-N.com, and let me be a support to you through online therapy and coaching. I'll be looking forward to hearing from you and being a support to you. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I am excited to have Maggie Craddock. Did I say it right? Craddock. Craddock, thank you, is a veteran executive coach known for her work with Fortune 500 CEOs and senior management. She is also a certified therapist and the author of Authentic Career and Power Genes. Today, we will be talking about her latest book, Lifeboat. We all love Titanic movie, so we're going to learn a lot today. Navigating unexpected career change and disruption. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. It was sweet to uh, read your book. I think um, um, all I needed was the, the, the song uh, to, to go with it, but you've done an amazing <laughs> analogy that keeps coming back and to uh, the Titanic, because I think almost everybody has probably seen the movie or at least knows about the actual Titanic. But more than anything you talk about, which is so important, um, you talk about what it is that we um, maybe deny, maybe we hold a blind eye, maybe uh, subconsciously, not consciously hold a blind eye. And then we are suddenly surprised and um, don't know what to do and we go into a panic mode. It's our life, it's our um, businesses, it's our career, it's our identity. There are so many areas that when we are working, whether we're in the business world or a certain industry or, or we are uh, an employee of a certain industry that um, things change and we know things change. <laughs> very quickly before we knew anything. I remember just to share this with you and then give you the ball to roll with. Um, I've been a therapist for 30 years and I've had set my, uh, my uh, uh, system that I work with so well that I thought nothing. I mean, I could be 80 years old and I would have a full practice. Maggie, this thing happened and um, my practice went to zero in one day. Wow. Wow. I sat there. I know I sat there. I'm like, oh, well, that was uncertainty. <laughs> Obviously, it went back and, you know, systematically went right back. But it was an awakening. It was an awakening that you cannot have an assurance no matter what. And I think probably a lot of businesses are facing that too today. And a lot of people who are at work, but not sure or lost their job due to the pandemic. So this is the best time your book came out. So let us know. Well, Dr. Fujin, thank you so much. And thank you also for that really personal example. You know, I'm hearing so many things that are similar to this from clients all the time. They will call me up absolutely surprised by how fearful they are over their financial situation. And they'll say things like, you know, Maggie, I never really considered myself a materialistic person. And we'll have to talk through the issue of it's not necessarily that. It's what money has meant to you in your family system, how you've been taught to value it. Is it a sense of security in an insecure world? What's going on with that? But one thing we do know at the heart of all this, Dr. Fujian, is that the skills that we need in our lives and careers when it's business as usual are not necessarily the same skills we need to develop when we're grappling with this level of unexpected change and disruption. It's happening on all levels, right? 
And it brings us back to something that's timeless. And that's those questions that the Titanic survivors faced within themselves and amongst their, you know, their colleagues, their fellow survivors. Questions like, you know, how long will this last? Mm -hmm. How bad will this get? Who can I trust to give me relevant information to guide me here? And how is going through the whole, this whole thing going to change me? Because when we look at what we can learn, in terms of the shift in mindset that it takes to be effective at a time like this, we realize that you can have a really good career if you're smart. But to navigate this type of period and have a great career, you're going to need to be brave. That's exactly what we tap into with this book. You talk about first assessing the environment where you work at, whether it's your business or your com the company you're working with. And this concept of um, what is the environment? What is the culture of that space? And should I stay? Should I go? Should I be different? Should I be different um, versus what is, uh, you know, with what is going on? Can you mm -hmm. share a bit about that? Absolutely be happy to. Because one of the things we talk about throughout Lifeboat is realizing that you need to identify an organization that reinforces your core values so that you're going to be able to thrive there. Now, I have absolutely no bias around what those values may be. If there's one thing that we learn from reading Lifeboat is that one size doesn't fit all. So for some people, an environment where people are very socially minded, compassionate, check in with one another is, is, is great. Other people want an environment where they're going to get cutting edge training and things like this. But, but to put any environment into perspective, um, Dr. Fujin, we try to help people look at what we call the difference between the big ship mindset and the lifeboat mindset and use that as a metaphor for understanding the group energy going on in a particular organization. Because when you align yourself with an organization, that group energy is going to impact every facet of your life, your self-esteem, your values, your behavioral norms on and off the job, right? Mm -hmm. So we use the Titanic metaphor in the book to help people understand what we mean by the big ship mindset, which isn't really about size. There's a lot of multinational organizations out there that, are, you know, they have people in senior management trying to grasp the lifeboat mindset. But what I mean by a big ship mindset when you're evaluating an organization is a mindset that's rooted in old norms that have worked in the past. Mm -hmm. This is how things have always been done. And we're going to stretch these ideas to their optimistic limit. And what makes the Titanic story such a terrific metaphor for being able to see things that we haven't necessarily seen before is if you look at the arc of that story, you realize that the problems that took the Titanic down started before the ship ever left port, started before there was ever any iceberg warning at all. It started cutting corners in terms of, you know, how things were evaluated, the decisions that were made. It started with everybody playing the part. And what you learn from the big ship mindset, a mindset rooted in old norms is you have a role. It's been scripted for you. Play it, minimize red flags, suppress uncomfortable feelings, play your part, stay busy and faster is better. Then we think about the mindset we need to really be looking at things through fresh eyes. And so we talk about this lifeboat mindset and to really put it in perspective is the overall shift it is when we look at what's going on with our lives and careers and all these different moving parts today. You, you try to put yourself into that felt sense of what it must have been like one minute to be on this ship that was heralded as unsinkable and the next minute you're huddled together in tiny watercraft on the Atlantic Ocean with complete strangers fighting for your life. That is an environment where you have more questions than answers. That's the kind of environment we're navigating in our lives and careers today. And that's one where I know you and a lot of other terrific people you talk with will really understand this business about the norms being present in the moment, not just rushing around, but taking strategic pauses when necessary. And we talk in the book about why that's so hard and actually how you, you activate that in your life and career under pressure. And then this idea of aligning your thoughts, 
your feelings and your intentions in the present. Because as I'm telling people all the time, really brilliant people, that inner alignment of your thoughts and your feelings and your intentions trumps trying to think your way out of a thorny situation every single time because your thought process gets hijacked under pressure. When we're, when we're you know, feeling balanced, of course, we're pretty objective and strategic. But under pressure, that thought process gets polarized. We're prone to black and white thinking. And when emotions start to take us down, we will create a narrative in our own mind to justify that story we're telling ourselves. And sometimes we need that overall shift to look at things differently. When you were saying that, it also showed up for me with that analogy is that in a big ship, what we do is um, we think there's a system to all of this. And when there's a system, then I don't take my role very, very seriously in the system to know how much it's important for me to be proactive and look at things and be part of all of it. Like you said, I might just say, the system runs, obviously it runs, because this is a huge boat and it runs as a huge organization. But then in a lifeboat, if it's eight of us there, 10, 15 of us, if every single one of us has a crucial role that we take seriously, because at any point, this steerer could be me. In right. a big, in, in a big um, ship, I don't think I'm just gonna be the captain of the ship at any moment. But in a smaller one, I take on the responsibility that any moment I have to use every skill in my life that I've ever had to bring it in, uh, to be, uh, you know, to survive not only for myself and everyone. And I think that's part of the, uh, you bring it up um, in, your, in your book about shifting the mindset to become proactive in, in that way. And um, with that, then also, also comes the recognition of, um, you know, how to be, how to assess, um, how to see the red flags, what to do with the red flags. So part of um, a conversation that you have in the book is when I see the red flag, what do I do like as, a, as an employee of a company? Or I see my, I'm, I'm a business owner and I suddenly start seeing the red flag, whether in the way that I've designed it or, you know, the world changes around me <laughs> and that therefore there's a red flag. When I see the red flag, what do I do? And this is such an excellent question because, you know, we, we go through an example in the book that actually takes you into the dynamics that took place on lifeboat number six. And it brings up two important characters from the Titanic story. One of them was, doc, was uh, quartermaster Robert Hitchens who was put in charge of lifeboat number six and another one is Margaret Brown. And they actually contrast this difference between freezing under pressure and trying to play a part that's not working anymore and particularly what you're referring to around the enhanced accountability that takes place in these lifeboat situations, because you can be called on, you know, the balance between leadership and followership becomes much more fluid, right? Yeah. You can be called on to do an awful lot of things in that moment. So when we're talking about, you know, what causes you to freeze, what causes you to sort of procrastinate or, or, or act out, or react in ways where I have clients call me and say, Maggie, something just happened and that wasn't me, right? I, I just uh, sabotaged an opportunity with a prospective client, or I had my opportunity to speak truth to power and literally nothing came out of my mouth, right? What's going on with this, right? And I'm telling them all the time, this is what I would call a lifeboat learning moment, right? That was you. But what happened was there was a breakdown first in your conversation with yourself and your ability to hear and listen to yourself and have that full inner alignment, which can happen when we're terrified under pressure. But that takes us as we work through the lifeboat process. You go through working through something I call your inner iceberg, which are all those undercurrents of feeling about the, the areas that you're comfortable addressing and where you're comfortable accessing your strengths. And the area is that probably because of the norms that were established in your family system, you're less comfortable with. Some people are very comfortable leaning into conflict. In fact, they think if they're not fighting, they're not bringing their A game to the job, right? Other, you know, other people are uh, extremely uncomfortable 
right? With being in a situation where they feel that someone else isn't approving of what they're doing or isn't validating what they're saying. So this can throw them into a tizzy. So we understand dealing with what's going on with that inner iceberg and making more of that conscious so that when you're tempted to freeze, right? The book really helps you understand where to start, the questions to ask. So many people say to me things like, Maggie, it's all changing. and I just don't know what I want to do with my life and career. I mean, what I've been doing is just shut down. And, and we start with that pre-work. We start with understanding precisely why it's okay not to know. Mm -hmm. Precisely the conditions that have caused us to be operating more emotionally and not questioning the conversations we're having with ourselves. I always tell people all day long, that the biggest impediment to communication, including those important conversations we're having with ourselves is the very illusion that we're already doing it. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're operating on automatic pilot and you can do all the great personal growth exercises, career selection exercises in the world. But if you were doing them from the perspective of a false self, they will not be sustainable. And then we get to what's going on with the other people in that lifeboat your ability to be patient with yourself, your ability to, to accept your own emotions in the moment, even the less virtuous ones, and understand that that's just part of the deal and not waste a lot of energy suppressing them is what gives you the skill to make the very important shift from operating relationally with others in such a transactional way, because we're all just playing those parts, right? That have been scripted and establishing that more human rapport. And that is what we must do with other people in the present. We must skew to the side of establishing that human rapport when, you know, survival is often a big priority for an awful lot of us in business right now. And we have that enhanced accountability. We may have to shift parts. We may have to, you're the follower, I'm the leader. We're going to have to work together to get through this whole thing. Something that uh, showed up for me as you were talking, um, and I've seen a lot obviously with my clients, with uh, companies that I've worked with. And uh, what I say usually is when people are in a company, everything that they've ever had in their sibling rivalry and their parent, uh, you know, dynamic with their parents shows up exactly there. So with their bosses, <laughs> you know, with their bosses, we do exactly the same thing that we've done with our mother or father or any of them that we didn't have a, you know, finished business with. And then with our coworkers, definitely sibling rivalry. Like we oh, do yeah. exactly what we've done with our sisters and brothers, right? So there is a definitely a concept of victimhood that starts with uh, when something shifts and um, obviously it's not my fault, you know, it's the, it's the system's fault, it's the issue, you know, this person's fault. And, we, and especially mid-management, I think is, is the best because it's always either the top, uh, the top <laughs> layer's fault or the bottom, either the, you know, either the employees are not working well or the top management just, you know, wants something that is ridiculous. So this mentality also, and I was listening to you and going back with the, what you said about the big shift and the smaller shift, and you see how people do, uh, do a different um, uh, way of being with the big shift in, in this context, that when something goes wrong, you usually like, who's, who's at fault? Like, is it the, is it the captain? Is it, who, which crew is not doing their job? So we go first into the mode of um, finding faults with who's supposed to do something and they're not and go into a victim place. Um, while where we are in the small group, people really come together in a crisis. Like nobody cares anymore when it's only 10 of us in a, in a boat, whose fault it is. Like we don't care whose fault it is. All we wanna know is uh, can we all get to the shore safely? Like we really tune down to what is important at this point and not necessarily the relational pieces. Um, you know, the, the, the relation becomes important, but it becomes much more empathic, human to human, like you said, working through, getting it, you know, moving together to somewhere versus, you know, we're all different departments and I'm just gonna sit here and say, which department didn't do it right? And this is how I'm getting, isn't that the experience you also have? It, it, is, it is so well said, and it is so true. And I think one of the opportunities that we have at this time, when we're talking about books like Lifeboat, other terrific books I know you've talked to authors about, things like this, is 
we have a chance to hit reset and understand some really powerful things about the conversations we have with ourselves. And as we do this, we reclaim the ability to chart our own course professionally and not have this dictated for us by outside forces. And this is really important because I know you've seen this a lot in your professional practice. You've just told me, right? You'll have somebody come in and they're, they're it's sixes and sevens over some narrative. This happened and they're outraged that their staff missed this or didn't hear them or misunderstood. Or they're, they're feeling like a victim because their boss has taken credit for an idea or doesn't understand or what have you, right? And they have scripted a narrative for themselves that I think actually serves a very vital purpose. It kicks up a lot of internal adrenaline, right? particularly when we feel out of control. That can sort of medicate people like a good cup of coffee. I do it too, right? But, but we have to understand that when we're in a situation that really is dire, mm -hmm. that as you were saying, you know, if there's only eight of us on a boat, it doesn't really matter that much. And because many of us now, I mean, look at the two of us having the opportunity to connect on Zoom, right? Many of us now are working from home. And this is a marvelous learning opportunity for almost all the steps we talk about in the lifeboat process. Because if you think about it, any minute now, either one of us could be interrupted by a family member or something going on or what have you, right? So the first learning thing is, let's say that you, you lose an important document or God forbid you lose an important client and someone close to you, maybe a close staff member tries to call you or someone in your family interrupts you at just the moment you're trying to process this. What is your internal reaction in that moment? How do you react to them? Are you patient? Are you centered? I don't know. It may depend. But it's a really good close look at the way you talk to yourself under pressure when things aren't working swimmingly. Like let's say you discover that suddenly your, your client base dries up as we were discovering, right? And then what's the conversation you're having with yourself around that? And most important, what is the emotional tone of acceptance around those feelings? Because we like to think that we're very logical in our thought process. Often we are. Under extreme pressure, again, the black and white thinking can happen. You know, it's over forever, right? Well, no, it's not. You come back on stream with that. The emotional triggers we deal with, and they're everywhere in our lives right now. When, you know, there's only one or two triggers at a time, most of us can keep our game face on. But when it's coming on every level, am I safe? Are my kids safe? What's going on with my retirement income? Oh my goodness gracious, is national security in, under, under threat today, right? When it's all hitting us at once, it can be a bit much. Yeah. And that's when we have to learn to take those pauses and learn to keep that pressure in perspective, stay balanced. In one minute, tell me what is it that we haven't talked about and you want everybody to know about it. I think... You know, there, there are little things you can do in your life right now that will help you get a felt sense of what going through the lifeboat process is like. One of the things is we talk about pausing. I would encourage your listeners to try to take 20 minutes a day to do everything at half their normal speed. So they just get a conscious sense of what that's like and what they notice in the moment. The other thing is one of the greatest antidotes for fear is to take every opportunity you have to do something good for another person without stopping to calculate what's in it for you. Because if you stop to calculate what's in it for you, sometimes the moment's over. And the thing is, when you take those opportunities, sure, you never know who's watching, but the person that's watching is you. It's a good muscle memory to get into because it reminds us of that resilience. It reminds us we're all in it together. Thank you so much, everyone. Lifeboat, navigating. Uh, unexpected career change and disruption. Thank you so much, Maggie, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And for all of you, um, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, take good care. Bye-bye.
Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian Zhe. Do you feel stuck at home? Do you feel stuck in your life? Well, don't you wish that you could just take your hand across the nightstand and hit the life reset button? Well, I've got news for you. Here it is, life reset. The awareness integration path to creating the life that you want. With the simple process, 12 questions, and the process to go deep inside and look at where you are, creating an awareness of the present moment, healing the past, and envisioning a future, and giving you tools in how to take care of yourself and be a whole and complete person as you go into the future. Here it is. Go to Amazon.com or Fujian.com and get your copy now. This is the time you can actually take care of yourself. You deserve it. Thank mm -hmm. you.